هذه الجلسة مع جيسون أن صوفيا سيأخذنا في رحلة إلى المستقبل وهي بعنوان الثورة الصناعية الرابعة نظرة مستقبلية وبعد الانتهاء من الحديث سيتم فتح باب الأسئلة من الحضور Ladies and gentlemen, our third session is brought to you by the Knowledge Ambassador Jason Silva who will take us on a journey to the future with a session on the fourth industrial revolution a future outlook and foresight of a future shaped by the digital revolution. Jason, please welcome on stage. Thank you. Microphone. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's a thrill to be here back in Dubai. How's it going today? Good? Yes. So I'm very excited to be back here in Dubai, and I just want to say what an honor it is to have received the Knowledge Ambassador Award. So thank you, Mr. Jamal and the Knowledge Foundation. It's really a thrill. So for those who don't know me, my name is Jason Silva. I am the host of National Geographic Channel Brain Games, a television series about how our brain works sort of neuroscience approach to how we perceive reality, but also how we misperceive reality. And this is a passion of mine, this is an interest of mine, particularly how we misperceive technological trends, how we misperceive the speed at which technology is changing our world. I also recently hosted a show on National Geographic Channel called Origins, The Journey of Humankind. And in that show, we looked at transformative moments in the future of humanity. Key moments that changed the game. Moments like the ones we're living through now with this fourth industrial revolution. In the show Origins, we looked at the emergence of language. We looked at the emergence of medicine. We looked at the emergence of transportation. But of course now, we're going to see the emergence of a game-changing suite of technologies that are going to transform what it means to be human. There's a great line that I read once that was saying that there are decades where there are weeks when decades happen. And I think that's a great quote to kind of summarize what's happening with these exponential technologies. It has been said that with the Industrial Revolution, we transcended the limits of our muscles, and with the Digital Revolution, we're transcending the limits of our minds. So where does this begin for me? I am a television host, I am a storyteller, and I am an artist. And as Marshall McLuhan famously said, it's always been the artist who realizes that the future is the present and uses his work to prepare the grounds for it. So why this passion for technology? Well, it starts with a passion for human creativity. It starts with a passion for human imagination. And this has turned for a passion into a passion for technology because I believe that technology is the embodiment of human creativity in the world. Technology is the literalization of human imagination in the world. Technology is the human mind turned inside out. Technology is the extension of our creativity and our agency in the world. The cognitive philosophers David Chalmers and Andy Clark in their extended mind thesis, they refer to technology as a scaffolding of our minds that we use to extend our thoughts our reach and our vision. And it has always been so. If you go back a hundred thousand years ago to the savannas of Africa, when early humans first picked up a stick on the ground and used that stick to reach a fruit that was on a really high tree, we've been using our instruments, we've been using our tools, we've been using our sticks to extend our reach, to redefine our boundaries, to transcend our limits. We didn't stay in the caves. We haven't stayed on the planet. And soon, we will not stay within the limitations of biology. Now, technology, 
right, has always changed who we are. The philosopher Marshall McLuhan, he famously said, we build the tools. But guess what? Those tools build us right back. Everything that we design in the world is designing us right back. It's a circular effect. It's what they call a self-amplifying feedback loop. So we build tools, and then those tools change what's possible for us. With those tools, we create new tools. And then with those tools, we create new tools. And it's like a runaway train. Look how far we've come. Look how fast we've gotten here. Now, today, of course, we live in the age of radical disruption. That's the name of the game. In Silicon Valley, it's a word that they love, right? Disruption, transformation. But technology has always been disruptive. See, human beings, we're funny creatures because on the one hand, we love novelty. We're explorers. We're tinkerers. We love to create new things in the world. But we're also afraid of change. We resist change because change is scary. Change can change the status quo. But technology, even though it was always disruptive and always creating change, that change accrued over many generations. So that's why it didn't feel as disruptive in previous times. Because you were born into a world that didn't change very much in your individual lifetime. The changes accrued over many, many, many generations. But that's not the case today. Today we're living during a time of exponential change, where the disruptions, where the technological transformations feel as if there's an earthquake under our feet. It's very scary. People are worried about jobs. People are worried about the state of the world. Sometimes they do irrational things because they get scared, because they fail to understand the nature of technological progress. There's a futurist who is now the head of engineering at Google. His name's Ray Kurzweil. Now, when I read his book, The Singularity is Near, it changed my world. He was the one who, for the first time, articulated for me why these changes were happening at the speed that we're witnessing today. You've probably heard the term Moore's Law, which is a term used in Silicon Valley, of course, to describe that these, you know, the computer chips get infinitely faster and smaller over time and they get cheaper. Now, Ray, Ray Kurzweil extended this idea. He calls it the law of accelerating returns, and it has allowed him to be incredibly brilliant at predicting the space, the speed of these technological changes we're seeing today. Now, I might have used this example last year, but it's important for me to make sure you guys understand the difference between linear change and exponential change so that these technological upheavals don't seem surprising to you and instead all of us can be better prepared to leverage these disruptions to make this a better world. So here's the difference. Our brains, the human brain, evolved in a world that was linear and local, right? When we think about change, our instinct, our intuition is linear. And that's because 100,000 years ago when there was a tiger in the and that was, or a lion and it was gonna run it, running over to eat us, we had to make a linear calculation about how fast it was going to get over here. That's our instinct. Linear mathematics, linear change over time. That's how we think. But technological change is not linear. We now live in a world that is global and exponential. And I know that this word gets used and reused, but you have to understand the difference. Ray Kurzweil's example is if you take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, by step 30, you get to 30. 30 linear steps gets you to 30. No big deal. But 30 exponential steps, you know where this is going. The same amount of steps, but exponentially, gets you to a billion in the same amount of steps. And that's the reason why the smartphones in our pocket are a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, yet a thousand times more powerful than what used to be a $60 million supercomputer that was half a building in size 40 years ago. The supercomputer that was 60 million bucks and was as big as this building in 40 years has shrunk to a device that you have in your pockets today, which is in fact a thousand times more powerful. That is exponential progress. That is exponential change. That is a unique opportunity to change the world because your whole lens for problem solving needs to make that switch from linear to exponential. 
your frameworks of interpretation when you make plans on how we can use these tools to impact society for the better need to change, need to be exponential. You know, I, I find this particular region of the world, Dubai, is an example of exponential thinking. When you think of how fast we've seen this place rise in the world, it's incredible. I think the rest of the, the world could learn from a lot of what I've seen here in terms of exponential vision. And of course, it doesn't stop in the supercomputer in your pocket, right? In the next 25 years, that supercomputer will shrink down to a device the size of a blood cell. It'll probably reverse engineer us from inside out. It'll go in our bodies and brains in the forms of nanotech, nanobots, curing all kinds of maladies. We'll download software patches that fix us from within. It's going to change the game because, again, these exponential trends are continuing. So this is where it gets exciting. So what do we do now in the meantime, right? We surf the wave. We prepare ourselves. We start to think exponentially. You know what we also need to do? We need to disrupt ourselves, right? There's this idea that you either disrupt yourself or somebody else is going to do it for you, right? Billion-dollar companies, as Peter Diamandis likes to say, will rise out of nowhere. But billion-dollar companies will also disappear just as quickly. And a lot of companies, when they start, they're disruptors. And they like to mess with boundaries and be rebellious and be bold in their thinking. But then when they become successful, they become conservative. Because now they've got a really good business model and they're no longer as incentivized to disrupt themselves. But these exponential trends don't stop. The genie's out of the bottle, right? So if you don't disrupt yourself, you will be disrupted. I recently made a couple of videos in alliance with the folks at Singularity University who are also promoting exponential thought. So I'd like to show you a couple of these. The beginning, the first video I want to show you is on this idea of disrupt or be disrupted. If you can please show video number one. I think organizations tend to be innovative at the beginning. When they're the new kids on the block, they're willing to experiment, they're willing to be disruptive, they're willing to do things differently. And as organizations begin to have some success, they start to get cemented in their ways. They start to get comfortable with their ways of doing things. The problem, however, is that technology's relentless path forward, its exponential progress will continue. So unless a corporation is willing to question everything, unless a corporation is willing to disrupt itself, it will be disrupted nonetheless. Now, automation is coming. Robotics is coming. Non-biological props and scaffoldings that augment human intelligence and optimize productivity are coming. Now, from this will come new uses for human brains because increasingly we're going to dovetail a lot of the things that we do at work to the machines. This is a truth that may be uncomfortable at first, but in the end will transform what most corporations are capable of doing in ways that we can barely even begin to imagine. In other words, what seems scary is actually the biggest opportunity in the world to change our ways and become more interesting, more innovative, and more creative. So again, think exponentially. So the key idea here, of course, is to think exponentially. Sorry that that seemed to be out of sync. But uh, the key idea, again, is to think exponentially. So of course, <laughs> if you look at the media these days, people, of course, are rightfully concerned about how bombarded we are with data. We almost don't even know where to look. We don't know what to pay attention to. We don't know where to aim our focus. They're saying we live in the attention economy. Attention is the new limited resource. There's a thousand and one signals bombarding us. And so our attentions are fragmented. It is very overwhelming. But the truth of the matter is that <laughs> above all the noise, there's really three overlapping revolutions that you need to be paying attention to. They're called GNR, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, artificial intelligence. Now, we've been talking about exponential change in the digital space. I've gotten to travel around the world and try to convey how important it is to think exponentially, and most audiences embrace 
the initial idea of digital disruption because they've already seen it. You know, we've seen the smartphones get faster. We've seen them get cheaper. We've witnessed it. And so I don't get much, much pushback on digital exponential thinking. But people will often ask me, well, what happens to the world of flesh and concrete, right? Because we are biological beings, and the man-made world, the human-made world is made of concrete. So people say, well, that, that can't be changing exponentially, right? That, that can't go as fast. But it turns out that the world of flesh and concrete is also becoming an information technology and thus is also subject to these exponential trends of advancement. So let's take the world of flesh. <laughs> we are biological beings. And the, the nascent disruptive industry now is, of course, biotechnology and genetics. Biotechnology means mastering the information processes of biology. Because it turns out that we are linguistic to the core. We are made of language. DNA is code. We are made of language all the way to the core. Richard Dawkins says, if you want to understand life, do not think of throbbing gels and oozing liquids. Think about information technology, words, instructions. And so with biotechnology, biology becomes a programmable medium. Biology becomes programmable. And this is advancing also exponentially. For example, gene sequencing, the speed at which we can sequence our genes, is now going three times faster than exponential. It's going three times faster than Moore's Law. The XPRIZE Foundation recently had a contest for a medical tricorder that was the size of a smartphone. That means a smartphone-sized device with what they call laboratory-on-a-chip technologies that can diagnose you better than 10 board-certified doctors. How does that change the world when deployed in a rural village? Or Google, Google's Larry Page, creator of Calico, a new company called California Life Extension Company, a software company for biology that had a Time magazine cover story, perhaps a bit ambitious, but good. It's called Google and the End of Death. And they were talking about advances in biotech that will lead to radical life extension, not just reprogram our genes away from diseases, but towards radical longevity. As the previous panel was saying, how does this change the kind of contributions that people can make in the world when turning 60, 70, 80, 90 no longer forces you into retirement? You no longer have to deteriorate from the ravages of time. Instead, freeing human creativity and ambition for an infinite amount of decades to come. This could change the game. There's a company called SENS, Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence, where the colorful character Aubrey de Grey, the British guy with the very long beard, is literally working with money from Peter Thiel to cure aging. Obviously controversial. Obviously we're going to have to adjust to the implications of this. But first and foremost, if we're interested in alleviating human suffering and democratizing access to health care and medicine, we need to embrace biotechnology with the most intense fervor and enthusiasm ever. The smartphones of the future will be the smartphones of biotechnology, where we'll download software patches for our biology and change the game. Then, of course, we have nanotechnology. Nanotechnology means patterning atoms, the building blocks of the physical world, the same way we pattern ones and zeros in digital technology. That was the analogy that worked best for me because all of a sudden with nanotech, we're talking about a physical world that is programmable. A physical world that can self-assemble. Buildings that build themselves, for example. Moving from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance because scarcity is contextual and technology is a resource liberating mechanism. As Peter Diamandis wrote in his book, Abundance, Why the Future is Greater Than You Think. The seminal book on nanotechnology is perhaps Eric Drexler's book, The Engines of Creation. 
It's an appropriate title because nanotechnology is the engines for transforming how we manufacture and create things in the world. And by the way, nanotechnology exists in nature too. When you plant a seed in the soil and it turns into a tree, that seed is an information file that tells the matter around it to self-organize into a tree. So nanotech exists in nature. We're just borrowing technologies from nature and leverage them, leveraging them for humanity. And nanotechnology is also advancing exponentially. If you want to get people excited about the future, you have to empower them. You have to make them feel that they can have an impact on the world. And with these advances, everybody gets to partake. Everybody gets to participate. So we've talked about digital tech, we've talked about biotechnology, we've talked about nanotechnology, and the next one, of course, is the elephant in the room. It's AI, it's robotics, right? It's non-biological intelligence. It's non-biological minds. It's non-biological thinking. And some people are afraid of AI because they think the robots are going to rise against us. But I think a better interpretation of what's going to happen is to think of these minds as extensions of our own. We are a cyborg. We are a hybrid of biological and non-biological parts. We do a lot of our thinking through our tools and technologies already. The human mind exists, or emerges rather, in the interplay of brains, tools, and environments. That's why the lighting in the room can change how you think. That's why the clothing you wear can change your perspectives on the world. That's why writing things down can help you memorize them and learn them. Our tools and technologies, a lot of our thinking is already more than just biological. Again, we are a cyborg species. We create tools in the world, and these extensions of our intelligence work in conjunction with us to make us more creative. There's a great line by Kevin Keller. He says how impoverished this world would have been if we didn't have the technology of the musical instrument in time for Beethoven and Mozart, or if we didn't have the technology of the oil painting in time for Van Gogh. What new tools and technologies will we create in the world that will unleash new forms of human creativity, that will unleash new possibilities for human enterprise that we cannot even imagine? So I tell you, pay attention to biotechnology. Pay attention to nanotechnology, pay attention to robotics. And this next video is precisely about this. Please show video number two. Increasingly, humanity finds itself drowning in information. We are choking in a deluge of data. We are increasingly suffering from bandwidth anxiety between our Twitter feeds and Instagram feeds and Facebook feeds. Most people talk about the fact that now we live in the attention economy. Attention is the new limited resource. Attention is the new oil. If you don't have ADD today, you're not paying attention. This is the question on everybody's minds. How do we curate what we pay attention to? How do we push aside the noise and focus on what's important? Stuart Brand used to say, science is the only news. The rest is the same he says and she says that you see in the media. And so if I were to be talking to entrepreneurs, if I was talking to heads of companies, I would tell them, pay attention to exponentials. Pay attention to disruptive technologies. Pay attention to the progress in artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology, right? The big three, GNR, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics. These are the forces that are upending the world. These are the new trillion dollar industries that are going to emerge out of no place. Think exponentially, pay attention to disruptive technology. So, <laughs> I'm a communicator, I'm a storyteller. It's very important to me to reach the hearts and minds of people all over the world and to inspire them, to make people optimistic about the future, to make people excited about what's possible. We all need a map to orient ourselves in the world. We all need a North Star, right? We all need something to inspire us and to push us forward. The inspiration behind all the videos that I've made 
which have received over 100 million views across all channels. The inspiration behind Brain Games on National Geographic Channel, which was seen in 171 countries, all goes back to this same desire to spread knowledge in the world. So thank you for that recognition today, Mr. Jamal, by the way. But it is human curiosity. It is human knowledge. It is human passion. It is that human yearning to reach further to transform ourselves, to achieve what's never been done before. As Neil deGrasse Tyson famously wrote, doing what's never been done before is intellectually seductive. We must do it. And we must inspire our young people to dream bigger than ever before. Bill Clinton had a Time magazine cover story called A Case for Optimism a few years back. And in it, he cited a United Nations study that found that the cell phone was perhaps the greatest invention in human history to pull people out of poverty. What new technologies will we create and how will they transform human possibility, human longevity, human health? Now, we've hit upon biotech, nanotech, and artificial intelligence. We've hit upon exponential change. But these are complex ideas, right? Unless you're a scientist, how do you get young people excited about this stuff? You need to be a storyteller. You need to convey these ideas in a poetic way. The medium is the message, the style. You know, one of the terms that was used to describe the rise of fake news was weaponized mimetics. Now, a meme is an electrified idea. A meme, to coin, to, there's a coin is a term coined by Dawkins to refer to a replicator that's synthetic. So when you put an idea on the internet and it spreads and it goes viral, that's a meme. So when the whole fake news thing started to happen, people started saying, oh, this is weaponized mimetics. People have figured out how to weaponize bad ideas to warp thought, to distort people's lenses of reality. Right? We see with lenses, we, with our lenses, we see through our lenses, but we don't always see the lenses themselves. And sometimes those lenses can be thwarted polluted, right? warped by weaponized mimetics, bad ideas that spread like viruses. How do you fight that back? We've seen conversations about that at this summit, which is wonderful. But the other way you do it is by creating good content in the world, right? Weaponizing good ideas, good knowledge, curiosity, wonderment, inspiration, and awe. Some people fear biotechnology. They fear the Frankensteinian scenario. They think that we're messing with the natural order. And I go back and I say, that's what humans do. We are the natural order. We improve upon the world. We alleviate suffering. We boost possibility. This next video is all about biotechnology from an optimistic lens. Please show the next video. We've all seen the world be utterly transformed by information technology over the past 30 years. We've empowered a new generation of citizens with supercomputers in their hands to impact the world. Billion dollar businesses have emerged out of nowhere. And information technology is now swallowing biology. Biology is now becoming an information technology. It's called biotech, mastering the information processes of biology. And so what we're seeing now, now that gene sequencing is accelerating three times faster than exponential, we're seeing progress that's going to transform the world of biology faster than information technology transformed the world of computers and communications and digital. So what this means is healthcare is about to be radically upended. It means the age of personalized medicine. It means reprogramming your genes away from disease and aging. It means smartphone apps for biology. It means Google's Larry Page creating Calico, the California Life Extension Company, and scoring a Time Magazine cover story called Google and the End of Death. It means everything that it means to be human is about to be transformed. It means transcending, perhaps even aging. So biotech is about to change the world. Thank you, guys. So 
As you see, I believe that putting these ideas in the world in a way that infects people with a sense of possibility and optimism and that, yes, we can address the grand challenges of humanity. This is my North Star. This is what moves me more than anything. And so on that note, I have one more video, which is on nanotechnology, and then I'd actually like to open it to a Q&A because I think it's all great to hear from you guys, and maybe I can address some of your concerns because I think a lot of these ideas <laughs> some can somewhat to take people aback. So please show the video on nanotechnology, the next video. To transform the world in ways that we can hardly even fathom. There was a great book written by Eric Drexler called Engines of Creation. That really says it all. So nanotechnology essentially allows us to pattern atoms, the building blocks of the physical world, in the same way that we patterned ones and zeros in the digital universe. If we can have that same kind of impact on the building blocks of the physical world by patterning atoms, all of a sudden we can have buildings that assemble themselves. All of a sudden we can move beyond scarcity because everything is made of atoms, right? We can turn anything into anything else, right? So the age of fighting over scarce resources, the age of scarcity is upended. We move into a world of infinite abundance. This changes the nature of economics, it changes the nature of manufacturing, it essentially makes the physical world a programmable medium that can be shaped by thought and intentionality. It turns the physical world increasingly into a condensation of human imagination. It's going to change the game. This is nanotech. Thank you. All right, so it says that we have about 10 minutes left. I'd love to open it up to Q&A. If anybody's got some questions, I don't know if we have some microphones. We have microphones over there. So I think we have a question here, third row, middle. Um, hello, I'm Nafil Kithiri, a mechanical engineering student. And I'm, I'm always, I always think that we're so lucky that we, love, we live in this era where, as you say, exponential growth, but I will call it logarithmic growth yeah. math, as a mathematician. And I, I've seen Elon Musk's point of views about artificial intelligence and the founder of Facebook. They both have a different point of views. Yeah. And what happened recently in the... Um, uh, Art artificial intelligent Facebook uh, shutdown. It, it, if, if Mark was right and he was optimistic about what he sees in the inter artificial intelligence, why did he shut it down? Unless that he is also afraid of the upcoming rival of artificial intelligence. Sure. Thank you for your question. Um, look, I think all disruptive technologies are double-edged swords. This is something that we have to kind of accept as part of the, part of the deal. Fire, when, when, when mankind first harnessed fire, and we were able to cook food for the first time. There's a whole book about it called How Cooking Made Us Human. Because cooking is essentially a prosthetic stomach, an external technological stomach that pre-digests our food and makes every meal more energy efficient so we can stay full for longer and have, all of a sudden have time for the development of culture. Before cooking, you know what we spent 90% of our time doing? Chewing. Like the chimpanzees, literally. So cooking made us who we are. But guess what? Fire can also burn the village. The beginning of true weaponry, right? You could burn and hurt and do bad things. Technology is the great amplifier of the human impulse. And how we direct that impulse is the human story. We can do it in socially acceptable ways. We can do it in socially destructive ways. Language according to the founder of Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly, was the first singularity. Singularity is a metaphor from physics to describe what happens when you go through a black hole. The laws of physics collapse. When language emerged, that was like a line in the sand. And her early humans on the previous side of that line could never imagine the world that humans after language created. This entire enterprise is a linguistic construct, right? Words become worlds. Social consensus and culture is a linguistic construct only made possible with language. 
None of this would be possible. Collaboration on a mass global scale, the way human beings have achieved, is not possible without language. But guess what? Language can be used to promote hate speech and fake news. And it's all these problems. The internet, it freed us from the constraints of geography. Good things and bad things can come from it. So more specifically to your question about artificial intelligence, Yes, some people think the robot overlords will rise up and enslave us. I personally don't think so. Neither does people like Kevin Kelly, for example, or Ray Kurzweil. They believe we're creating narrow intelligences. Narrow intelligences that are highly specialized and they're not yet self-aware. And a lot of people don't think they can be self-aware unless they're embodied because so much of human consciousness comes from how we interface and are mediated by our environments and other people. So... I think that we make a mistake when we assume that these thinking things will be the type of thinking that we do. There's all types of other thinking that exists in nature. And I think we just need to broaden the definition of thinking to make space for these augmentations. I also think that, back to the ideas of David Clark, or Andy Clark and David Chalmers, the cognitive philosophers, that we need to transcend or go beyond this idea that we end at the edge of our skin. That's the skin bag bias, they call it. And they say that our humanness goes beyond our physicality. That if you were to draw, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man today, you would put a smartphone in his hand and you'd point to it with like a diagram and it would be part of his anatomy. That we literally are part of our tools and technologies if we just zoom out a little bit and actually witness ourselves. Terence McKenna famously said that we are extruders of technological material. We take in matter of low organization, it goes through the filters of the mind, and we extrude space shuttles and iPhones. If you could see a time-lapse movie of human progress, it would look like our thoughts spill out of our minds and become concretized as objects in the world. That's what we are. That's what we do. Marvin Minsky said, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, they will, but they will be our children. So that's my answer to you, and thank you for your question. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm a physician and scientist, and the question is, it seems that technology is going ahead of other things, like philosophy and religion, and we are not really catching and put control on what the science is going to take us. Um, with technology, probably there will be more people living on this planet, and food cannot catch that increase in the number of population. So what are we going for? Are we going to eat each other just to survive? Where is the control of sure. religion? Where is the control of philosophers that direct us to the right direction yeah. without going longer life, sure. without going into sure. um, be stronger and more virtuous? Yes. There should be a leech control the human. Yeah. And that's what happened. And all the disaster happened uh, because some people were more advanced than others and controlling others. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I appreciate, I appreciate your cause of concern and your cautiousness in the face of human ambitions because human ambition can sometimes get us into trouble. So I do hear you. Uh, I can't speak necessarily for the role of religion. I will leave that to the experts. But I can speak to the role of philosophers. Philosophy means love of wisdom. And aside from the sort of academic placement of philosophy in the world, it truly just means love of wisdom. It means to think deeply about things. And I can probably, I can say that my entire career comes from trying to look deeper into things and try to provide a kind of microscope for these ideas. You know, even a blade of grass, as the philosopher Henry Miller wrote, when you look at it through a microscope and you give it your full attention, becomes an astonishing universe. All of these ideas are worlds that we can explore. But, you know, it's difficult in the attention economy. There's a lot of distractions. So to bring a love of wisdom to these ideas is, is my whole reason for being. It's, it's my, entire inter, my entire career. So that's what I'm trying to do. And there are many others like me. The, whole, the people at Singularity University, this summit is all about looking deeper into things and a love of wisdom and a love of knowledge. To answer the second part of your question, you're concerned about overpopulation. This is not necessarily something that most people would consider. 
But I've seen experts who will actually say the following sentence. Overpopulation is a myth. It's really an issue of scarcity and resources. You could actually fit the entire population of the planet in the state of Texas, and there'd still be plenty of space between each person. Also, most of the planet is empty, and most of the planet is water. So the issue is not that people won't fit, but it's whether we can feed them, as you say. But that's the whole point of nanotechnology. I mean, when you're manipulating atoms, you could turn concrete into a fruit. I mean, you're literally getting into the space of manipulating matter at the level of atoms. Everything is made of atoms. Everything is made of the same building blocks. When those building blocks are programmable, you realize, as the book Abundance puts forward, that <laughs> scarcity is contextual, right? Aluminum used to be more valuable than gold. They used to serve royalty in, in aluminum silverware, you know? And then with electrolysis, all of a sudden, the aluminum is so abundant, it's a throwaway material. We don't care about it anymore. So imagine the ways that nanotechnology will change how we make food. I mean, you know, you, you heard a session before about 3D printing. We'll be, we'll be able to 3D print food. I mean, I, I, I have optimism that we will address those concerns. But I share your caution that we need to temper our ambition with a love of wisdom and consider the implications of all these ideas. So thank you. I think we have time. Oh. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time. Much love to you guys, and thank you for having me, and thank you, Mr. Jamal and the Knowledge Summit. Thank you. Thank you.